Assalamu alaikum dear learners. I welcome you all here in Allama Iqbal Open University Studios. English language, I won't call it a language. Rather, I would like to say it, it's a medium, an international medium for communication. If I don't know English and I go anywhere where everybody around me knows English and doesn't know my language, it will be very difficult for me to communicate with any other person. So I think we should not learn English just for the sake of examination. We should learn it for good. And today to learn the basics of English, that is, of course, the topic of today. And I promise that I'm going to bring an interesting topic. The topic is parts of speech. And to learn these basic parts of speech, the basics of English language, today we have our expert, Mr. Arshad Mahmood. Assalamu alaikum, Mr. Arshad. How are you doing today? Fine. Walaikum assalam. What about you? I'm good. Today, the topic that we have selected for our dear learners is parts of speech. And I would like you to clear every bit of it. As that's the basic, right. as far well as I know. Right. Basic, very important as well. Uh, parts of speech are the words like verb, noun, adjectives. We'll be starting uh, the things uh, formally. But uh, before that, I just want to tell you and my learners that these parts of speech are very important aspects of English because whenever you construct a sentence, some of them are always used in these sentences or in other words we cannot make sentences without these parts of speech for example we can't make a sentence without a verb or sometimes without a noun so these things are very important so dear learners a word may fall into any of seven functional classes according to the work it does the seven classes are noun pronoun verbs adjectives adverbs prepositions and conjunctions occasionally a word is used without any grammatical force it is then called an interjection the seven functional classes and the introduction together form the eight parts of speech. Here is something very interesting. In these eight parts of speech, we haven't discussed the article the no. or an. -N. And why is that? Why? I don't know. But uh, the thing is really, you see, it is so important. Whenever you want to make a sentence, for example, this is a book. I'm using a. Ah, okay. This is an orange. An. And where is the book which I gave you? The book. No, you ask a question why. Yeah. So the answer is very interesting. English, when it was developing, it used Latin as a model. Right. And in those days, Latin and Greek, they were classical languages. So when English grammar was developing, people developed English grammar on Latin. And in Latin, since article not, not is a part of speech, there are eight parts of speech. So in English, they have got eight parts of speech. How right. natural. That. Latin, we can say, is the ancestor of basic English language. Yes, it has given a lot, uh, a lot of vocabulary to English, and unluckily, a lot of uh, grammatical constructions in the past. But now, with the passage of time, like English has been changing, and it has changed a lot. If you compare English today with English that was used in, let's say, uh, 9th century, 10th century, there were so many strange endings of words, mm -hmm. and it was simply because of the effect of Latin. But now the things are changing and English people have started feeling that uh, like it is their language, they should speak English, not by modeling it on Latin. But that is the fact that English and Latin have got some interlinked roots? Uh, not roots, this is how they thought, but that is wrong. That is wrong, right. Uh, so first of all, uh, we'll discuss noun. If we look at the word noun, we will come to know that it has been derived from the Latin word nomen, right. which means name. And some of you might be thinking about the Urdu word for that. What is that name in Urdu? For noun? It's no, name, what do we call in Urdu? Naam. Naam, good. And in Punjabi it is? Na. Na. And in Pashto it is Noom. Noom. Something very interesting, you see, all these words in four to five languages, and I think in some of the uh, uh, northern languages, like uh, Shina Brusheski, maybe one of them, it makes use of the word that is maybe Noom. Starting with na sound and the in the world there's there. all, the basic sound all, three, is there. All, all three sounds, na, uh, and ma. Hmm. So nam or name or num or num. So they've got uh, some sort of similarities. I don't know why. But it is a, it is a name of a, uh, a like um, person or a thing or a place. Right. right. Dear students, a noun is the name of a person or thing. And you are seeing a passage on the screen. And in this passage, there are some italicized words. These are all known. It was perhaps a year after his marriage that Sadid was awakened late one night by the sound of a horse galloping on the road. 
followed by a loud knocking at the door. So here you can see that all these words which have been italicized, they are nouns. And you can simply, you can ask yourself the definition of noun, you will get the answer from the passage. The term thing, as far as it is concerned in the definition, it must take uh, to like, it must include the things like a place, for example, London, Multan, Leicester, L-I-C-E-S-T-O-R, people might pronounce it Leicester, that is Leicester, France. It may include, for example, a quality, for example, truth, happiness, and it may include an action, for example, murder, knocking. Noun is a very important part of a sentence in each language. Masood plucks a flower. So here, Masood is a noun. Noun has got different um, types. We can discuss these nouns from different angles. For example, we can call them proper nouns, common nouns. For example, girl is a common noun. Common noun. And Rizwana is, is a proper, proper noun. noun. City is a common noun. And Lahore is a proper, proper noun. noun. The, then, the sentence you just said, Masood plucks, plucks a flower. flower. So in this sentence, Masood is a proper noun and a flower is a common noun. Common noun. But if we say rose, yeah, that is proper, proper noun. A uh, particular name is proper name noun. Is, name is proper noun. Just a definitely. name is noun. Exactly. Name of anything. Uh, nouns can be also like, they can be dealt with uh, from uh, other angles too. For example, we call them abstract nouns yeah. and concrete nouns. For example, happiness, I can't touch. I can see, but I can feel. That is an abstract noun. But uh, book is a concrete noun. Then we've got um, countable nouns and uncountable, uncountable nouns. nouns. It is something very interesting if you compare different languages. For example, I say in English, my hair is black. Yeah. Your hair is silky. Yeah. But in Urdu, what do we say? My hairs are. Hmm. So it means, in English, it is not countable. Uh, in English, we use here as, in Urdu it is, not, it is not countable, in English it is countable. So we say, my hair is. But suppose if I had some hairs on my palm, on my shoulder, I can say, well, I can see there are three hairs on my shoulder. Right. Then, then they will be counted. Counted. Same is the case with the words like bread. In Pakistani society, we people eat naan or roti or chapati. If we go to um, uh, naan by shop, we say, uh, we want to buy naan, we'll say, give me two, three, four naan or roti. We add two, three, four, it means bread is countable. countable. But in, the, in English society, it is uh, uncountable. They would say, give me some bread. Right. So these uh, nouns vary from culture to culture, from language to language. Right. Dear learners, now we'll move from nouns to verbs. Well, about verbs, I would like to ask you something. When I was so young in my school, we used to learn a statement, a mathematical equation. Action plus tense equals to verb. That statement is still ambiguous in my mind. Kindly explain that. Verbs, if you look at definition of a verb, verb basically is used to denote an action. Right. So plus tense. Verb in English also uh, denotes action. For example, if I say I go and then I say I went, there's a marked difference. The tense I'm changed. using I'm using action, that is verb, with the help of verb go. At the same time, I'm changing the tense. When I say I go, I'm using present tense. Mm -hmm. But when I say I went, I'll be using past. the past tense. And if I want to say something in future, I'll add will. So right. I'll say I will or I shall go. So a verb always need, needs a tense with it. Yes. Oh, yes. Any form of tense with it. In English. In some languages, uh, for example in Chinese, verb does not stand for tense or time. It doesn't change its shape, it is used only for the sake of action. For example, in Chinese they say, I eat today, I eat yesterday, I eat tomorrow. Well, thank God Chinese is not the universal language. That is very difficult. You're right. Go on. So a, a verb is a word that indicates being or doing on the part of the person. Being or doing. Now I would like to define the word verb for you people. Verb is a word that indicates being or doing on the part of the person or thing denoted by the subject of the sentence. The word verb has to be derived from Latin word verbum that means a word. Every sentence must contain a verb expressed or understood as part of the predicate. Predicate I hope you know uh, when we analyze a sentence it is uh, basically analyzed into two different parts. One is subject the other is predicate. For example, when I say the boys are 
writing a letter. So the boys is subject and writing a letter is predicate. So whatsoever comes after subject is called predicate. So every sentence must contain a verb as part of the predicate. In other words, a verb is the most important part of a sentence. Most verbs denote an action. For example, he went, he went to home or home. Well, one of the common mistakes uh, committed in Pakistan, he went to home is wrong. We must say he went home. Although after went or go, we, we must use to, but when we talk about home, we don't use to. Look at uh, the comparison. I went to Lahore, they are going to college, they are going to the mosque, but they are going home, not to home. Second sentence, most people like dogs. In this sentence, like is a verb. The moon rises at seven. Here, rises is a verb. The postman brings letters. Here, brings is a verb. And uh, you must uh, keep in mind that a sentence uh, is incomplete without a verb and it's so important that sometimes we can simply make a sentence with just one or two words for example when I say come here or if I say sit that's also conveying the meaning so it means verb is a very important uh, it's just like backbone of a sentence we cannot avoid using this uh, we have talked about the verbs which state an action for example going eating drinking some verbs denote a state. For example, they seem happy and he is the culprit. Here you see is is a main verb that usually is used as a helping verb or auxiliary. But here in the sentence he is the culprit or he is a doctor or he is a student is is being used as a main verb. This is also used for change of state. For example, the boy became an artist. Could you see the transition? A boy who was not an artist becoming an artist. Verbs often appear in compound forms. For example, they are walking. Here, walk is a main verb that is changing into ing form just because of the helping verb are, that is are. I do know this, do and know. I'm using do know. It is not showing any sort of, let's say, chain in action or tense, but simply it is emphasizing uh, the fact that I know something, I do know. For example, do sit down. He had gone. Here had is being used with uh, the verb go that must be in third form because of had. Were they missed? Again, were and missed. Question form. Uh, because of were, it is in the third form. Will you have finished by five o'clock? No, this is interesting. Will have finished. It is about future, but future uh, perfect. Something that will be completed in some particular time in future. Will you have finished by five o'clock? The house had been sold. Again, had been and sold or sell is a main verb here. In each sentence, these verbs make a group to convey the requ required message. It means if I drop any one of the verbs in a group, it will be considered a mistake. For example, Sana reading a book. Is it the right sentence? Do you believe it? it is right? I think that is wrong. What is missing, by the way? From here, uh, the auxiliary verb is missing. Sana is writing a letter. We cannot drop is, otherwise it will be wrong. Now we'll move to the third part of speech, that is a pronoun. Right, it is a word used in place of a noun. If we look at the very shape of the word carefully, we will easily understand its function. The prefix pro means for or in place of something. So here pronoun means a word that is used in place of a noun. Why? Number one, to avoid repeating a noun. For example, as soon as my brother met his wife, he told her the news and they came to Islamabad. You just look at this sentence very carefully. You will understand the whole idea. As soon as my brother, so brother is a noun here, met his wife. I cannot say as soon as my brother met my brother's wife, so I would say his wife, then he told her, her his wife, uh, the news and they, who they, my brother and his wife. So this is used to avoid repetition. If you try, I hope you can make many sentences like this. Number two, we mentioned pro persons or things without actually naming them. That is yours. That might be, let's say, a book. It might be an apple, anything. Nobody knows much about him. Nobody can be anybody. 
everything was new everything we cannot count the things but simply talking about all of them in general collectively so everything was new only four of the members remained all of them are pronouns now there are some types of pronouns which might be intimidate, intimidating for Pakistani learners but don't worry they're quite easy first of all we'll discuss the reciprocal what they call reciprocal that is wrong reciprocal pronouns this is each other or one another uh, here is some problem uh, in Pakistani uh, grammar books they say each other is used for two for example um, they each other e each of them or they helped each other uh, it means two of them uh, and Pakistani books, they suggest it should be one another for people more than two. But today, modern English suggests that both of them are right. For example, we can say people should help each other instead of people should help one another. I mean, both are right, but we should not say each other is wrong. So this is called reciprocal uh, pronoun. Second is possessive pronoun. That is my house, his house. So this sort of possession that is uh, called uh, sort of... Uh, in, in, in Latin they call it genitive case, uh, I'll use easy term that is possessive, can be showed, uh, shown with the help of two different shapes, for example, using my, his, her, and the second is, for example, Ali's book. Now here apostrophe and S shows a possession, it means the book of Ali. So possessive noun is also very important, for example, my house, his book, their drama, or their uh, possessions, their property. Uh, so it is important. Now moving to personal pronoun, I and we, first person singular, plural, second person you, and again plural you, and third person he, she, it, and plural is they. Then we've got uh, distributive uh, nouns like either, neither. I'll be giving you some examples which are uh, used like, uh, which are wrongly used in Pakistani society especially by the students in examination hall. Uh, the last type is a reflexive pronoun. Reflexive pronoun is a pronoun that is uh, re that reflexes the subject. For example, I did it myself. I cannot say I did it my or I did it me. I did it myself. She has injured herself. So reflexive pronouns, uh, pronoun is important in English as well. Now, looking at some of the mistakes committed by people in Pakistan, I remember when I was in BA, I, I had a, a statement that was to be corrected, which I could not. It was, uh, either of the possibilities are true. And I did not know what the mistake was. I asked some of my friends and they also, they said it was okay, it was misprint. But that, is, that was wrong. No, I understand that was wrong. Now look at the sentence, neither of the boys is my cousin is the right thing. We cannot say neither of the boys are my cousin. Uh, boys is plural, but this is is not linked with boys. It is linked with neither. So we use neither for two persons or thing. Uh, in the similar fashion, either of the answers is correct, not are. It should be is because of either. And again, either is used for two persons or things. If you want to use for more than uh, two, or, uh, two, two persons, you will say none or any. For example, none of the buses has gone. Here none means more than two. And he is one of my best friends. Can you try some sentences? Uh, I'll give you more examples. Allah Iqbal is one of the best poets. Not one of the best poet, one of the best poets, because we are talking about so many poets and he is one of them. So we are using he is one of them, uh, one of the best poets, not poet. Then we've got an important part of speech that is adjective. It is a word used to qualify a noun or pronoun, that is, to add something to its meaning and so to restrict its application. This too has developed from Latin. And the base was eject, A-D-J-E-C-T, that means added. And I'll give you some examples. An interesting book. Here, interesting is adjective and book is noun. Sparkling eyes, sparkling, adjective, eyes, noun. Four men remained. In this sentence, four is adjective. Oh, unhappy me. Unhappy, adjective, me is pronoun. Give me that book. That too is an adjective. And then you've got one more example. Uh, this bridge is unsafe. Unsafe is 
again adjective. So adjectives are very important part of speech and they have degrees just like verbs have forms. For example, we say good, better, best. But usually we have a pattern to follow. We add er or est to certain adjectives which have got one syllable. For example, tall, hard, fast, long. You can see all of them got one syllable, so they take ER as comparative degree and EST in the superlative degree. It means an adjective has got three degrees, positive, for example, tall, comparative, taller, for two people, uh, he is taller than me, I am taller than him, and tallest. Here I would like uh, you to pay special attention to the part EST of superlative degree. EST is usually pronounced as est in Pakistan. For example, tallest, biggest, hardest. That is wrong. You must avoid it. It should be ist. So we've got the words like tall, hard, fast, which are monosyllabic words and we must know how to pronounce their superlative forms. Mm -hmm. uh, how would you pronounce, for example, uh, the third form of or third degree of tall? Tallest. Big. Biggest. Fast. Fastest. Hmm. Got the idea? So, est should be changed into ist. It is tallest, tallest biggest, biggest, fastest. Right. But best, best remains this best. Thing. It means we should not follow spellings in English. If we follow spellings, we won't be able to pronounce many words correctly. So, in this case, uh, in superlative degrees of uh, monosyllabic words, we must pronounce est, est, as ist. If you followed spellings, what would we pronounce? Listen, listen. Then again, you're right. And many people pronounce words like D E B T, debt, right, and hustle. <laughs> and one interesting word, I N D I C T. If you ask any Pakistani, he would say, indict. But the word is indict. 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 I would like. So you see, it is just because of spellings. Uh, moving to the second type of adjectives, like the words which have got more than one syllable. These, for example, are horrible, beautiful, and wonderful. These are uh, not used uh, with the help of ER or EST. We add more or most. So it is like more beautiful, most, most beautiful. beautiful, more horrible, most uh, horrible. Yes, and more interesting. Most interesting. Most interesting. These things are very important because uh, sometimes people uh, use like they say more faster. Mm. Adding more and again adding E R at e the end. Mm. It should be either faster or more, more fast, fast is not used by native speakers, it's faster. Mm. So all languages make use of uh, adjectives but the places might be different. You're calling it adjective. Adjic. Adjective. Usually people say adjective. 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 That is wrong. Uh, and I believe in all natural languages adjectives are used because without these adjectives we cannot, let's say, uh, talk about statement. somebody, we cannot uh, talk about somebody's positive or negative qualities. So in total we can say parts of speech are basically the bricks that are going to make that path on which we can move to the, on or, the way of English. Sure, sure. It's very important. So in French, it usually comes before a feminine noun, mm -hmm. before a feminine noun and after masculine, but may change its place, like uh, depends on different languages. In French, for example, we say uh, ciel bleu, that means sky blue. Right. In English, we say blue sky, sky. and in uh, Persian, interestingly, we say asmane obi. Mm -hmm. Asman means sky, Abi means blue. blue. Adjective coming at the end, but mm -hmm. doesn't mean they don't use adjective before nouns, they also use. There are some examples in English which might be confusing and at the same time interesting. Look at the examples like uh, uh, Secretary General. In newspapers, in news, you will see people uh, using uh, Secretary General of the United Nations. Mm -hmm. Why not general secretary? So general is a word that is adjective, yeah. secretary is noun, but they are following like what they are doing, they are using uh, secretary first and general, general after afterwards. that. Mm -hmm. The reason is that I think it is uh, simply because of the French influence mm -hmm. that adjective is coming after the noun. Right. 
And there are some uh, interesting cases, for example, uh, the words like fast and hard, all these things we'll discuss later on. Right. So uh, uh, look at, for example, uh, the word, uh, mm, some, some adjectives in Urdu language. Acha, bura, acha bura, or what, lamba, chota, these are all adjectives. But the difference between English and uh, uh, Urdu is that in Urdu language, when we change the noun, mm -hmm. adjective changes to right. achha ladka, mm -hmm. but when we change ladka into ladki, what will happen? Achhi. Achhi ladki. And when we change uh, ladka and ladki into plural, log, then achhe log. Achhe log. But in English, look, good boy, good girl, good people. Well, English is easier, I think. <laughs> Here, you're right. Uh, moving to the next uh, theme, that is adverb. An adverb is a word used to qualify or restrict the meaning of a verb, adjective, or another adverb. For example, adverbs used with verbs. He came quickly. So quickly is referring to or adding something to the meanings of came. Second, adverbs used with adjectives. He became extremely annoyed. Annoyed is adjective, extremely is adverb. And the third, adverbs used with another adverbs. He behaved quite fairly. You see, fairly is already an adverb that is being supported by quite another adverb. So from these examples, uh, it will be seen that adverbs supply answers to the questions how, when, where, why. So we call these adverbs uh, adverbs of place, manner, time. Uh, many adverbs are formed uh, from adjectives by the addition of the suffix li. It's very important, for example, quick, quickly. Uh, beautiful, beautifully, but be careful in the use of the word costly. Costly is not an adverb, this is an adjective. Costly means expensive. And fastly is no word in English. People say he runs fastly, it is wrong, he runs fast. So fastly is no word. And then look at the word hard. It can be used as an adverb as well as an adjective. For example, he works hard, adverb. This is a hard surface. This is an adjective. So these uh, adverbs are definitely important. We should know how they are used and how and where they are used. Uh, for example, we should have the sense of adverb of time, place, and manner. For example, he comes at 6 o'clock. This is adverb of time. He comes to the hall, adverb of place, and he comes slowly. This is adverb of manner. All these are very important in all languages, I believe. Then we've got a proposition. It is a word used with a following noun or pronoun to form an adverb phrase or an adjective phrase. The words, for example, in, through, into, of are all prepositions. Other prepositions are about, above, across, after, against, etc. Prepositions may express such meanings as possession. For example, the book of my friend, of, direction, to the bank, to, place, at the corner, at, and time, before, now. We must be very careful in the use of on. For example, in Urdu we can say he is sitting in the bus, in the plane, in the train, in the boat, but in English we must say on the bus, on the train, on the plane. If somebody says he is sitting on the plane, it does not mean he is sitting on the wing of the plane. Is it possible? I think not. Then you should be careful in using the terms like in and on. The difference, for example, he's sitting in the chair or he's sitting on the chair. In is used for a chair that has got arms and on is used for the chair that is without any arms. And then the differences between above and over. Uh, I hope uh, you know these things, but just to revise. Over is used for a thing that is moving. For example, I can see a bird flying over the building and above is something that is you that is that is hanging but not moving for example I can see uh, a fan above my head and then there are uh, some prepositions commonly misused in Pakistan grammatically for example asset a double -S, s e t you will often hear people saying asset for great people are an asset for nation that is wrong asset too and then believe in in Urdu we say believe on, I believe on God, but in English it should be I believe in God. And after attack, for example, we don't use any preposition, they attack the enemy. And I've heard many people saying, 
start with the name of Allah. It is wrong again. Start in the name of Allah. <clears throat> so these things are uh, very important from your examination point of view, for uh, your general interaction point of view. So these things must be learned. Then coming to the second last topic that is conjunction, I would like to explain it. Uh, it is a word used to, uh, to connect to words or groups of words. Uh, for example, John and his brother will go and is very important here. John or, so or and and these are conjunctions which can be classified into two classes. Number one, coordinating conjunctions such as and and or are used to join cl uh, clauses of the same rank. Whereas the subordinating conjunctions, uh, for example, are used uh, for, uh, for like joining two parts of uh, two clauses. One of them is dependent, the other is independent. Look at and and or, for example, yesterday I went to the ground and I enjoyed the match. And is coordinating conjunction. Now compare it with uh, when. I don't know when you will come. So when you will come is subordinating because alone it doesn't work. The last topic of the day is introduction. It is a word such as gosh, ouch, wow, which indicates an emotional state or attitude such as delight, surprise, shock, uh, expressing an emotion. For example, uh, alas, not alas, alas, he has failed all his papers, or ah uh, or hura. We use these expressions to convey our happiness or uh, sadness, these sorts of feeling. These are called um, conjunctions. Conjunction may not be called a grammatical word uh, as it does not play any functional role, but it is one of the parts of speech. So dear learners, these were eight parts of speech and I hope you've learned a lot, but I believe we'll be doing some of them in more details in future. Inshallah, definitely we'll be doing that. I hope everybody is very much clear. Everybody has learned a lot about parts of speech that I said earlier play the role of bricks on the way, on the path on which we can move and learn English better. So that's all for today. And the funny thing that came in my mind is Mr. Ashut gave us some example from some other language like Latin, like some other language like French. And I was just thanking God that English is the universal language and is easier as compared to French or Italian or any other language. Inshallah, we'll meet some other day with an interesting topic. See you there. Take care. Allah Hafiz.